Hi, and uh, welcome to this next video, where in particular, we're going to uh, discuss overfitting, what it is, and the symptoms of overfitting. And then we'll see in the next video how to, to deal with it, for instance, through regularization. Okay, so overfitting and underfitting. So let's try to motivate it through the things that we've already talked about uh, regarding supervised learning. So in general, right, when we do supervised learning, again, the basic idea is to look at the data and make sure that uh, or the hope is that the performance on the training data, meaning the in-sample error of the hypothesis that we train, is very comparable to the out-of-sample error E out, meaning the, the chance of making a mistake on new data. So, so if this is the case, then we could train to minimize the in-sample error and thereby indirectly minimizing the out-of-sample error and thus getting a good performance on, on new data. Okay, so to do the first step, right, ensuring that the in-sample error and in out-of-sample error are close, uh, the learning theory parts that we saw so far told us to choose a simple model, right, because then uh, given some amount of data, we can we get a stronger guarantee on uh, the closeness of the in-sample error and out-of-sample error. But of course, there's an issue with this. If you choose a too simple model, then maybe there's no hypothesis in your hypothesis set uh, that can even achieve a good in-sample error, right? So, and this is what we call underfitting, right? You chose a too simple model for, for the application. Okay, so this is a downside uh, for choosing a too simple model. But on the other hand, right, if we uh, wanna then minimize the in-sample error, then we should choose a more complex model to avoid underfitting. But when we choose a more complicated model, right, then we risk that the in-sample error and out-sample error are not close to each other, which is what we typically call overfitting. Uh, the things we, we overfit to the training data, we drive the in-sample error too far down without actually gaining any benefits in the outer sample error, maybe even driving the outer sample error up when we choose a too complicated model. Okay. So the issue is, of course, what should we do here, right? Uh, there seems to be like a controversy here or two conflicting directions to go, right? Should we choose simple models or complex models? Because we have these two goals at the same time, wanting the in-sample error and outer sample error to be close and uh, wanting the in-sample error to be small. Okay, so let's try to have a closer look at why overfitting occurs. So the symptom of what we call overfitting is that uh, the in-sample error becomes small, while the outer sample error uh, becomes large or is still large, right? So this means in some sense, we've found a model that looks really great on the training data, but actually it isn't if you give it new data. And this is what we call overfitting to the, to the training data. So we already saw uh, for instance, the VC bound that says something about the closeness of the in-sample error and the out-of-sample error of the hypothesis we produced, right? In particular, we had this guarantee, a generalization bound, saying that the chance that these two quantities are more than epsilon apart is no more than something that goes down exponentially in epsilon squared n multiplied with something that's about n to the d, where d is the VC dimension. However, the VC dimension is just a theoretical guarantee we can make, right? It just tells us that you know, if we have enough data, then we can be sure that these two things are close. It doesn't say that they're far apart if we don't have enough data. And, uh, and they don't say that they're far apart if the uh, model is too complicated. So in some sense, it's not really an explanation. It's just a guarantee we can make if we have enough data. So let's try to look for an explanation. Um, so, so one commonly accepted explanation is that if I have a very, pop, very a powerful model, one that's too complicated, or uh, has too many parameters to tune, then in some sense, it has a lot of degrees of freedoms of parameters right, that I can, I can turn. And what it's doing is, in some sense, it's using these degrees of freedom to fit noise in the data. Okay, so I think this is something that, that needs a closer look. So let's try to uh, run some actual experiments and some data and try to see if we can actually illustrate uh, fitting an, uh, the noise. So let's try to look closer, right? So to, to actually visualize this, we're going to have a look at polynomials. So, so what we're doing is we're looking at a regression problem when there, where there's a, an unknown target function f. And this target function is a polynomial. So we, it means that f of x is actually uh, the evaluation of some polynomial. And we're just going to zoom in on the interval from minus a half to a half. And now, uh, given such an unknown target function, right, the training data that we see are points on the polynomial, right? It's uh, points x and the evaluation, meaning the label f of x. So, so what would be a natural learning algorithm? Uh, so if we know that it's a polynomial, then in some sense, it would make sense to try and, and find a polynomial that fits, uh, that, that actually goes through these data points that we see. And we can actually do this uh, using a feature transform, which we saw in, in previous videos. 
So what we can do is that we would like to use our, our linear uh, regression learning model because well, we have a nice algorithm for doing it. So what we can do now is we can say, okay, given our data X, which is just a single feature, right? there's only one feature X, we're going to do the feature transform that maps X to one, X, X squared, all the way up to X to the K. So this feature transform, right? This is something we can compute without uh, looking at the labels, right? It's just a transformation of the feature vectors. We can do it before running any learning algorithm. So that's what we're gonna do. Uh, when we get training examples, we're gonna do a feature transform of the uh, of the feature vector x into this longer vector with one x x squared up to x to the k. And now we're going to run linear regression on this feature transform space. Uh, so which means that we, we're going to find the parameters for a linear model in this feature transform space that minimizes the sum of squared losses. Which means that we're going to find this hypothesis w uh, that uh, the best w uh, that on this data minimizes the sum of squared distances to uh, the hyperplane or the sum of squared mistakes. And now if we see what this is actually doing, you can see here if we expand this inner product because we do this feature transform, what we're actually training are finding are the coefficients of a polynomial, uh, W0 times uh, one, W1 times X, W2 times X squared, all the way up to WK times X to the K. So what we're really doing is that we're actually finding the best polynomial uh, to fit the data, to fit the training data, right? So it's a polynomial with coefficients that we're looking for. And this is, will actually be the polynomial uh, that has the least sum of squared uh, mistakes among all degree K polynomials. So you can actually use linear regression here to compute the best polynomial fit to a data set if you do a polynomial feature transform first. Okay, so this is the, the learning algorithm. So basically we're just gonna find, given our data that comes from this unknown target polynomial, we're basically just gonna train the best polynomial fit to the data. We're gonna find the best degree K polynomial uh, to, to fit these training examples. And we're going to do it from 15 uh, random samples. So these samples are generated by just picking 15 random points between minus a half and a half and evaluating the polynomial at these places. However, we're going to look at two different versions of, uh, of evaluating the polynomial. So we're going to get back to that. Uh, so the hypothesis set, we're going to compare two different ones to see this notion of overfitting and what it actually means, right? So, so one of them is a really simple model. It's uh, what we call H2. So the hypothesis set is just all the degree two polynomials. Right? So this basically means that we're going to do the feature transform X up to one uh, X and X squared. So it's a simple feature transform. And then we're going to use linear regression on the feature transform space uh, to fit. Okay, and the second one is we're going to use all the degree 10 polynomials, meaning that we have 11 parameters. And here we're gonna do the feature transform X up to, uh, where well, we have up to X to the 10 is going to be the feature transform. And then we're gonna run linear regression on those feature transform data points. Okay, so that's the, these are the two hypothesis sets that we're going to compare in, in this experiment. Okay, so what is the target function, right? So the target function here that we're looking at is a degree 10 polynomial. Okay, so let's see. So, so basically the, the target function is actually a polynomial. And so it's specified by these 11 coefficients. And then we look at the case where there's noise, right? So this is what we said before. There's a little bit of noise in the data and that changes the function evaluation a little bit. So, uh, so this noise here is, we just set it to something small. It's, uh, it just means that you don't get exactly the evaluation of the polynomial, this unknown target function, but you get something that's just a little bit off. And now the claim was before that if we had a powerful model, then it would try to fit this noise and this is what would lead to overfitting. So, so I think this is something we have to see, right? So, so let me share uh, an implementation of this. So let's see here. So up here, there's just code implementing this. Uh, let's just have a look at what it does when we run the code. So, so now it runs here, it generates, uh, these both the degree two polynomial fit and a degree 10 polynomial fit. So let's try to, let me just show you what's on these uh, different uh, runs of, the, of this experiment. So what you see here is uh, there's a blue function on each of the plots, and this is the unknown target function. Okay, so this is a degree 10 polynomial uh, that's being plotted here uh, from minus a half to a half. Okay, so this is this uh, blue uh, function in here the unknown target function. And then we have the, the data points, the 15 examples. And these 15 examples were just points that are 
uh, basic evaluations of the polynomial, but with a little bit of noise. So you can see that they don't lie exactly on top of the polynomial, but they lie a little bit above or a little bit below because we have this noise that we added uh, to the data. Okay. Now you can also see uh, the two different plots. And these two are the best. This is the best uh, degree 10 fit to the data, the red curve here. And the blue, oh, sorry, the green curve here is the best degree two fit to the data. So as you can see, right, the red one behaves really crazy when you look at this data, right? It, it's completely all over the place. And it's in most places, it's very far from this target function, the blue target function, right? And this was just this little bit of noise that drives the degree 10 polynomial because you, as you can see, right, it tries to actually fit the points perfectly. So it, it kind of, at least in, in some of these examples, maybe the one down here, you can see that it actually fits the data points fairly well of these training examples that we have. But if you go outside these regions where you have training points, it's, it makes crazy mistakes, right? It's very far away from the unknown target function. That's the blue function. But you can see, if you look at the degree two polynomial fit, right? It's uh, it doesn't fit the blue points as well as the as the red as the degree ten does, but it's it's much closer to the unknown target function, right? So in some sense, uh, these this very high degree of freedom, like the degree ten polynomial here really allows us to um, to do a, a fit to all this noise that's in the data. And this is what's driving these very crazy predictions that you will see here, right? So if I wanted to make a prediction on a new point, just to be clear, uh, if I get a new point somewhere along the, uh, between minus a half and a half, using the degree 10 polynomial fit, I would just return the value that the degree 10 polynomial tells me, right? So this could be very far off from the unknown target function. Okay, so, uh, so let's get back to the discussion here on, on overfitting. So as you can see, right, uh, so basically the thing that's, that's happening, right, is that we're really fitting all this noise in the data, getting some really crazy uh, predictions when we're not close to any of the training examples. When there was just a bit of noise in, in the data. Okay. So uh, there's also another example here, right? So, so let's look at an example where the unknown target function is instead of degree 50 polynomial, but uh, but there's no noise at all. So intuitively, you would think like if I have 10 degrees, I should be able to fit a degree 50 polynomial better than if I only had uh, two degrees. So here, there's no noise at all. Okay, so, so let's try to see what happens in this exam, right? So the target function now is degree 50 polynomial uh, with no noise at all. And I'm still training a degree two polynomial to fit it and a degree 10 polynomial to fit it. So, so let's have another look at, the, at this example. So let's go back to the experiments here. So down here, you can run the code for, uh, for, for doing this degree 50 unknown target function. As you can see here, um, things are better. So the degree 50 function is, again, the, there's a blue curve. Let's see if I can zoom in a little bit. That didn't help much. Okay, so you can see that the unknown target function is the blue one down here and let's see uh, no it doesn't really help okay so there's the blue unknown target function and uh, you can see that the green uh, fit that's basically just a line through it here that's the degree two polynomial fit to this data and so the degree two polynomial fit actually looks pretty good whereas if you do the degree 10 fit here it's sometimes it's okay in this region but it also sometimes makes some really uh, crazy predictions where it goes very far away from uh, from the, the target function, right? So it actually looks like, again, for a degree 50 target function with no noise at all, it still looks like the degree two polynomials give the best fit. Right? So maybe let's try to see if we can uh, explain uh, why we see this. So, so basically you get the, yeah, so here's the, one of these plots just shown uh, in large here. Uh, the unknown, uh, the target function, right, is this blue one here. The, the degree two fit is the green fit and the degree 10 fit is the, is the red one here. Okay, and, and this one is, uh, again, has some really crazy behavior uh, when you're far away from any of the training examples. Okay, so, so here again, I guess in the first case, we had this argument that the noise somehow driving the degree 10 polynomial to fit the noise. And that's why uh, we get these really uh, wrong predictions. But but here there's no noise, right? Uh, when we're using the degree 50 polynomial with no noise. So, so why is it that we get this uh, overfitting behavior? 
And this is sometimes in the literature referred to as what we call deterministic noise. So the way to think about it is maybe uh, if you think about using a hypothesis at set H, like for instance, H10 here, the degree 10 polynomials, then inside this hypothesis set, uh, there's some best fit to the unknown target function, right? So there's some H star that gives the best fit. And in some sense, you know, of course, F is not perfectly fit in here. So what we can say is that, you know, the things that we cannot fit, right? So basically the difference between the unknown target function and the best fit in the, in the hypothesis set, one can think of this as some form of noise, right? And for complicated models, you will try to fit this residual. Right? Maybe that's, that's some kind of sketchy explanation for why uh, you get these behaviors. Okay. And uh, just to distinguish the two types of noise or deterministic noise, and we call classic noise, which is actually real random fluctuations in the, in the labels, uh, we call those, uh, we call that stochastic noise. So then of course you can ask yourself, right? So does, it looks like here we saw two examples, right? In both examples, there was overfitting happening, right? The degree 10 polynomials were just worse than the degree two polynomials uh, always, right? So the question is, should we just always choose the simple model, right? Is that what we see here? Is the simple choice always the best choice, right? And the answer here is no, it's not, right? The, the issue, of, of, if you go back to this, the latter example here, right? The unknown target function was a degree 50 polynomial without any noise. So if we use the hypothesis set uh, containing all the degree 50 polynomials, and then if we have, uh, if we have 50 data points, we have a lot of data, uh, then we would actually be able to perfectly fit the second example, right? Because doing interpolation on a degree 50 point on 50 points on a degree 50 polynomial would actually give you the exact uh, polynomial, right? You will, you will recover the, the precise hypothesis or the unknown target function, right? So, so the, the thing is just um, overfitting really occurs when the model that we use is somehow too complicated uh, compared to the amount of training data that we have available. Um, so, so basically you just need more data in order to use a more complicated model. That's the, the main takeaway message, right? So, so that's, this is also uh, a good motivation for gathering as much training data as you can. So maybe let us just end this short introduction of overfitting by running one, one last example. So if we go back to the code here. Let us use do the last example where we do the, the noisy example. So we take the first example again, where we had a degree 10 polynomial with noise. And uh, we, before we, we saw a fit with the degree two polynomial, degree 10 polynomial. But let's say now we have more training data. So we already argued for the, the case with no noise at all, the degree 50 polynomials. If you had enough data, you could, it would be better to use a, a more complicated model. So here, uh, let's see that this is indeed also the case if we do um, more, more training data for fewer, um, for this noisy case of the degree 10 target function. So, so here you can see these fits again. And the unknown target function, if you look carefully, is, is this blue line here. And it actually lies almost perfectly on top of the, of the red line that we train using the degree 10 polynomial when we have a lot of data, right? So in most of the cases, right, they, they actually have the same kind of sign behavior in this example. And so the degree 10 polynomial is actually a better fit for this data. It can still go wrong here around the, the ends when you, uh, as you can see in a, a couple of these examples, right? When you don't have any more data that's to the left of this, then the prediction starts to, to get strange again out here at the boundary. But in between, the degree 10 fit actually aligns very well with the unknown target function, uh, much better actually than the degree two fit. So you just need enough data uh, to warrant using a more complicated model, okay? So let us end this on, on this remark and then in the next video we'll see techniques for uh, dealing with, with overfitting.